But what happens is, as you retire, and you watch, if you watch those races back, what becomes more ingrained in your brain is that TV picture of the race, which isn't my experience, but funny enough, so if you ask me about some of my big races from my career, the first thing that comes in my brain is not my experience that happened at the time, it's the TV picture, because that's the one that's been reinforced over the years. It's hard to pick a favorite role. Well, if I could still be an athlete, I would be number one. Um, what's second best? Um, I think from a from a still being close to your your to you know the sport commentating is is great. You know you are very into it. You're, you're following all the events and you and um, it's it's very dynamic. You know it's very exciting, dramatic, and so I thoroughly enjoy it. I wouldn't still be doing it after all these years if I didn't really enjoy it. And I'm going to cop out a little bit here, but I'm sometimes happiest standing by a track on a cold December night and it's raining and the you know, athlete I'm coaching is doing a long session. And, and I think that brings me back to my kind of roots a little bit. So they're, they're, all, they're all roles I thoroughly enjoy for different reasons, but I probably, as I said, from a, from a commentary point of view, it's, it isn't quite as good as running yourself, but it's, it gives you that wider perspective of our sport. You know, when, you're, when, you're, when you're an athlete, you look at your own event, you're very focused on that, and then, then you step out of that, you become a commentator, and you start to, hey, I need to know a bit about the pole vault. I need to know a bit about, more about the long jump. I need to understand sprinting a bit better, which gives you just that more all-round approach, I think. I get asked a lot about, do, do, for instance, Laura, Laura Waitman, do you like commentating on Laura, and, um, or would you prefer to watch? And actually, I used to think, oh, if I'm commentating, I'm going to get too nervous and too... I found that it's better to commentate. If I just sit and watch and somebody else is commentating it, I, I act like any other coach. I'm nervous. I'm kind of, you know, why is she in that position? Whereas I'm, if I'm commentating the race, I'm not concentrating on her so much. I'm kind of aware of what she's doing. Uh, so I now prefer to commentate because I get engrossed in the event in a, in a different way. Um, so I get more nervous, more stressed when I'm actually not commentating, if I'm just standing by the sidelines, as most coaches do, feeling completely helpless. You know, they're, they're out there and they're doing it and you're just now watching. Um, and it's great when, it, when a race is going well and the athlete is performing well. If it's not going so well, then you, you start to think about, okay, how do I deal with this afterwards? Whereas commentary-wise, I do the race, that's it. You, you call the race and then the result, and then I can kind of start to analyze it afterwards. So, yeah, particularly around championships, I, I prefer to be commentating. That, it's a good question to ask which is the best way to experience an event. Um, you're right, as an athlete, you, you, are, you often are processing a whole set of different information um, as you are as a coach. You're, you're more of an observer. You're not, you're not in the action. Um, <clears throat> and then as a commentator, I think as a commentator, you probably absorb it the least because you are moving on to the next event. That event's finished. What have I got next? It's the 200 meters, and you, know, and you almost have to wipe your mind quickly clear of it. And particularly as I get older, I find that sometimes it's you know, races and years blur into one. I've been commentating for well over 20 years now to try and remember where. And as an athlete, obviously, you'll, you'll tend to... But isn't it... This is, here's the funny one. <clears throat> when you're in your career, and what you should be remembering, obviously is the visual position of I'm in a race, I'm surrounded by runners, I'm running 1,500 metres and I'm hearing the bell and the crowd and, am I, and you're focused on that. But what happens is as you retire and you watch, if you watch those races back, what becomes more ingrained in your brain is that TV picture of the race, which isn't my experience, but funny enough, so if you ask me about some of my big races from my career, the first thing that comes in my brain is not my experience that happened at the time, it's the TV picture because that's the one that's been reinforced over the years. And so I sometimes have to really dig deep to remember a race from inside the race, as it were. And I've talked to a lot of athletes because your an analysis afterwards is often from the TV picture or you know, sit with the coach. And so maybe the person who has the truest memory is the coach because they're not actually in the event, they're seeing it you know, from, that, from the, that perspective of watching the race 
and that memory will always stay with them. So I think probably the, the most honest memory of an event is, is probably from the coach. The main piece of advice I would give to athletes is do not think about the next bit of your career unless you want to start falling back in your athletics career. Because as soon as you start thinking that this isn't what I'm completely focused on right now, you will not perform to the level, either which you used to or, which, or that which you want to. Now that's difficult because we all like to plan forward a little bit. Um, so there's nothing wrong with all the way through your career, perhaps having things you're interested in, maintain your involvement in those things if they're away from track and field. Um, <clears throat> it could be coaching. It may be the media. Um, it may be something completely different. So you can maintain that inf interest without changing your focus of what you're doing. Where the danger comes is when you start to think, what am I going to do next? Because you're not thinking like the hungry 20-year-old who all they're thinking about is next year's Olympic Games and I want to do this and I'm trying to improve and I want to beat him and I want to beat her. You st if, when you're 30, you almost still need to be thinking like that. Otherwise, competitively, you're giving yourself a huge disadvantage. Now, that's a difficult trick, really difficult. If you've managed to maintain through your career interest, some of the guys at the minute are singing. Could be something in the arts, it could, it, it, it could be accountancy, I don't know. But try and maintain, because I think even in your career that gives you some balance in your life, and it's something you can then gravitate to once you know you've come to the, and you'll know. The one thing I will say to most athletes, I mean injury can often force an, an earlier end than you want to, but you'll wake up one day and you know that you're not thinking in the same way that you were bef before and that you need to then start thinking about change. It is difficult. The biggest problem that athletes face, I think, is that the world outside works on a different cycle. It's a bit Monday to Friday, nine to five, Saturdays and Sundays for athletes. That doesn't matter. It's, you know, and, and also the, the long-term planning isn't always there. You get used to knowing that the Olympics are, you know, July 31st next year, I've had the World Championships, and say, you know, you've got a cycle that you, you know, your training's working towards that. So when you get up on a cold December morning, you might be not hugely motivated on that particular morning, but you know where it's going. Take those targets away, which is often what happens to people. They quit their event, quit their sport, and suddenly you can be a bit lost because you haven't got those kind of... So th that's the other thing I would say. Whatever it is you choose to do, try and treat it like you did your athletics. You'd be very goal-driven, bring it back to what am I doing today towards whatever that goal might be, and that will help you make that transition. You know, the hardest thing is just to stop and kind of be left in a bit of a, a blur, if you like, about what you're doing. It's funny, I, you know, I, I, every year I'm, I've been commentating uh, now for um, a long time. And so I keep thinking, how much longer do I want to do this? The sport brings me back to it. You know, we've had a, you know, had a great year this year that I thoroughly enjoyed. And new people, new names, big performances, and I get really excited still. So I, people say, oh, you must have other loves and other things you want to do. And I sort of do. You know, most of them are to do with, I still love travel, but I travel a lot. <laughs> there are some places I would like to go to, uh, particularly um, South America and the Andes. I'd love to go up the Amazon. So a lot of my things on my wish list are uh, kind of geographical. Uh, now, I turn a significant age next year. I would still like to get back under three hours for a marathon. That's another target. Um, so they're nothing to do with work, they're personal things. But while work, and I, I hesitate to call it work, you know, I, I thoroughly enjoy what I do. We organize, you know, I have a company, we organize running events as well, not to business and things, but the commentary is, is, is I love it. So, yes. Um, while I'm still loving it, another few years yet, I think, before I start thinking too much about what else I want to do.